please welcome your host, actor, musician, and Disney Parks aficionado, John Stamos. Hello! Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. I am honored to be back here at the D23 Expo. I never feel more comfortable than when I'm in a room full of Disney geeks like myself. Can you turn on the house lights? Let me see these beautiful faces out there. All right. I think we need a Disney-obsessed woman out here to help me moderate. And I think the perfect one would be my wife, Caitlin. She has Snow White's gentle compassion for others. She has Cinderella's strength to overcome hard times and emerge as Belle to see the beauty in this beast. Here she is to help me moderate, which is code for interrupt me for an hour, Caitlin McHugh Stamos. She's been here for four days, standing in line, doing things. Okay, thank you so much to my Prince Charming and fairy god husband. <laughs> He's making all of my Disney dreams come true, including getting to hang out with all of you guys here at the D23 Expo! We gotta start the show. First up, a true Disney legend who began his career as an animator under Walt Disney, working on such films as Sleeping Beauty and The Jungle Book, and returned uh, for a whole new generation of films, including The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, to to Toy Story 2, and Monsters, Inc. Please welcome Floyd Norman! from Big Thunder Mountain Railroad to Star Tours, Indiana Jones Adventure, and Disneyland Paris, it's Tony Baxter. Tony Baxter. He's a prolific producer, director, artist, and author who's, uh, who was behind such films as Beauty and the Beast, the Lion King, Waking Sleeping Beauty, Frank and Wiener, and Maleficent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Don Hahn. And last but certainly not least, uh, this gentleman is at the forefront of a new generation of talented filmmakers at Walt Disney Animation Studios. Paul was head of the story on Oscar-winning features Frozen and Big Hero 6. His directorial debut, Disney Animation's 2020 feature, Raya and the Last Dragon, was announced just yesterday here at D23 Expo. It's our new best friend, Paul Briggs. Paul Briggs. Right. Welcome to the stage. Hey. Let's ask some questions. All right. Floyd, while you were working at Walt's studio as an in-betweener, you would draw hilarious cartoons of your colleagues and of Walt, <laughs> which led to you being tapped to rewrite Jungle Book. Uh, you say it was cool to be in that room with Walt as long as he didn't notice you. <laughs> Why was that? And uh, what, Walt was such an um, impactful storyteller. Can you tell us about being in the room with him? Well, honestly, I think Walt Disney was a, a, an intuitive storyteller. Uh, it just came natural to him. He was, he just had this gift, and I can't think of anybody who connected with audiences better than Walt Disney. He just knew what audience, well, what would touch an audience, what would move an audience. And, and Walt was just a great storyteller. He was just, it came natural to him. Being a, a Midwesterner, uh, he really identified with the common man. And not only did his films play well in, in America, uh, they, they literally went across cultures. I mean, they, they, uh, fans love Disney around the world. So Walt was just a natural, and, and it's difficult to find storytellers who are that good, and it just it almost comes easy to them. So uh, it and was you, just a pleasure. To and when they, when they noticed your drawings, and the, you were kind of sassy with the drawings about Walt and stuff, but that got you noticed, and then, as you say, you went upstairs, uh, you were the fortunate one to go upstairs, and we worked on the Jungle Book, right? 
Yeah, and, and that's because uh, D uh, Walt's daughter, Diane Disney Miller, said that her dad was probably the best gag man in the studio. So Walt loved gags. Yeah. And so when he saw my gags about him and about the other Disney artists and animators, yeah. uh, he knew that I was, uh, maybe I should have been in the story department. <laughs> Funny guy. Well, storytelling is the currency of humanity. You know who said that, Don? I think it was me. It was you. <laughs> I'm glad it was you. It's so true. I mean, we pass along our beliefs. Uh, stories tell us how to be human, dealing with despair and difficult times. But also, in all, all of your storytelling, which I love so much, it, there's hope. There's always hope. And I think I speak for all of us that we need you guys more now than ever. So uh, no pressure. <laughs> How have you taken that hope that Walt, you know, captured so well and brought it into your films today? Well, it, it is inspiring because Walt's films always had that optimism to them, and his parks always had that optimism to them. He, but he wasn't afraid of showing all the sides of humanity. So he wasn't afraid of showing suffering and grief right. and, and ridiculous comedy. And, and he was all about the entertainment of it. So if you could take home a theme or something, great. But he was first and foremost about the entertainment and the experience that the audience would have. Because when we go to the movies, we want to know what it is to be human. Right. We want to know what it is to walk in the shoes of those characters, whether it's Pinocchio or Mowgli or whoever. Um, and that's what was so inspiring to me and, and you know, what we try to do in our movies now. And you do so beautifully. Tony, now he, this, this is my great bragging right that I know, that I know Tony. Uh, We've become friends, and I'm so grateful for that. And last, uh, two years ago, we had dinner, and I said, I got to get you on Splash Mountain because he created Splash Mountain, and it's, it's my favorite ride. And to get that picture, you know, where you go down the thing, and they take the picture, to get a picture with me on the ride with Tony Baxter, take a look. There it is. Hey. Yeah. Look at my, <laughs> but I, my big dummy, I covered his face with my hand. Funny. <laughs> I'm taking you back tonight, Tony. Yeah, we'll do it again. <laughs> Um, Tony, there is so much crossover between films and rides. How did you decide what to include from the films to create the Indiana Jones adventure? Mm. Well, you know, it was pretty easy. You have to look at the things people expect and, uh, and then depart from there. There were certain things in that film you couldn't do without the rolling ball. That could not be a, you know, a thing. And other aspects, you get the flavor of what the emotion of that ride was, or that film was. And it was all about action. <laughs> and what was interesting, I'm losing my voice. Um, in the early years when we started it, we couldn't have done what we did. We didn't have the technology to do it. So it was a case of the technology coming along that allowed that ride to actually happen. Because I think the unpredictability, the aspirational sense of being Indiana Jones, all of those things are what works in a story for a ride, as opposed to in a movie when you want to invest in the character, you become the character in our ride. So, how do we do that? How do we get the rolling ball? How do we get the doors to change? How do we get you know, a fire to happen every 18 seconds? Those are the things that are uh, a challenge and must be there for the audience to get the, uh, the effect of the, the essence of that film. And uh, filmmakers have worked hand in hand with and become Imagineers. Uh, what was it like working with Mark Davis, Claude, yeah. Claude Coates, Mary Blair? Well, I was so lucky because I call myself the oldest of the youngest that got in there. That meant I worked with all these people. I worked with Mary, Claude, and, and uh, Mark. Now, if you look at that sketch that Mark did of the pirate in the boat, straddling the boat in the dock, greedy with so many hats, you don't need a single word of a script or a s traditional story to read that drawing. That drawing is visual, and everybody that's not paying attention in the boats gets it right away. And that was his particular thing. His staging was impeccable. Mm. I don't think any other Imagineer I have ever worked with had the sense of staging as well as character design. But in a ride where you only have a second, staging is everything in telling a story. And his things were impeccably done. Yeah. And then Claude was exactly the opposite. If ever there were two people that were yin and yang, Mark was gregarious and Claude was humble. But Claude dealt in the world of backgrounds at the studio. And when he came over to Imagineering, he complimented Mark because he created these environments. And sometimes we don't give the background and the layout people the, uh, you know, the honor that the animators get. But in film, Walt once said about Cinderella that you, know, you wouldn't believe in Cinderella 
if you didn't believe in the backgrounds, be creating a real place for her to live in. That's why when the magic comes and the coach changes and the dress changes, you buy into that because we did such a good job of establishing a world. And that's what Claude did. His magic work with Blacklight and Fantasyland and the Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion. Nobody could do that. And then Mary, uh, Mary was just one of the most amazing people to be around in her understanding of shape and relationships of patterns. And she had some problems with her eyesight, so she wore three pairs of glasses. And that allowed her to see shapes or colors or anything else. So when you look at all those amazing patterns and everything, imagine looking through a kaleidoscope and getting all these different angles on it. And I think her childlike sense came through. And I know that both Mark and Claude loved working with her because she brought a look that they couldn't possibly do. Mary just had a way of seeing through the clutter and simplifying things down to a basic you know, design. Paul so Briggs, I see treat. you down there, Paul Briggs. Look at this <laughs> handsome young man. I'm, I'm like a fan. I want to just turn my chair. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm like, like, aren't you in awe of these guys on Absolutely. stage like, like we all are? Absolutely. But let me tell you something. After your big announcement yesterday, you belong on this stage just as much as anybody. Let that sink in. You're the next, you're the next legend. This guy is so incredible. He's so talented. He's such a sweet, sweet man. He also drew this uh, when I proposed to Caitlin, made that little drawing for us, and we're very grateful. What's your, what's your approach to storytelling? What, 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 well, what, was, the, what was the first movie, you, Walt Disney movie you, you were in? My favorite? Yeah. Raya and the Last Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> now, I do love, you know, each one has a very, and this is actually how I do approach storytelling. Each one has a very different meaning for me that I've worked on. I love all of the classics, too, though. But um, I come at it from a very personal place. And when I look at uh, Frozen, for example, can they you ask, voice? He, he's Marshmallow. I how did do, do Marshmallow. <laughs> I am. I'm a giant angry. I'm also Yama in Big Hero 6. Like, I play these giant angry characters, but I am not an angry person. Nice. I am so very nice. Yeah. I, I hope I'm pleasant. not. Yeah. No. Um, but I do come from a very personal place. Uh, when they asked me to come on to Frozen, I was like, I don't know, princesses. I love that. I love the singing and everything, but what's, I, I'm trying to find the connection. And I met with Jen Lee, and, and we talked about sisters. And I have four sisters, and I know, John, you've got a lot of sisters, so we understand sibling dynamics that are complicated. And, um, and so when, when Jen started telling me about this story about the sisters, I was like, I'm in. I get this family love, this family bond, that you would do anything for them at the end of the day. And even Big Hero 6, when they asked me to come on to Big Hero 6, I, I, I love superhero stories. I love Marvel. But really, at the end of the day, Big Hero, Big Hero 6 is a story about loss and grief and accepting that into your life. And I was like, I get that. I had lost my mom a year earlier, so I was like, this is a story that's important to me that I think other people will connect with and empathize with. So I am, that's really, I think, always what drives my storytelling. And also, you know what, though, real quickly to say this as well, Dean and I talk about this a lot with our movie, Raya and the Last Dragon. We... Uh, there's something special you want to say. I mean, Dean always says, like, it's the song in your heart. And I believe that, too. There is a song. I, I view movies as songs, and that's something that I guess that's also a big part of it. It's just like, what do you want to tell the world and sing out to the world? Nice. Well, that's, that's sort of what, what Dawn was saying, what you were saying about, you know, about what Walt did. I mean, showed, you know, despair and, and, and loss and, uh, and then hope at the end, which is really nice. Uh, all right, from Silly Symphonies to Fantasia, Mary Poppins, Walt knew the music that was so integral to stories. Don, you work with the most iconic uh, songwriters, and uh, you've done all these Broadway shows, including Beauty and the Beast. I'm sorry, took those, you know, in the movies Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, tell us about working with some of those composers and those lyricists. I think the thing they all had in common, whether it was um, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, or Tim Rice, or so many other different people, is they were storytellers. And that sounds obvious, but it's not. A lot of uh, musicals have songs in them that are just meant for entertainment, or the couple falls in love, so you feel like you have to have a love story. And what, especially what Howard was all about was plot. You know, you could, you could take a song like um, Ursula's song in Little Mermaid, 
Ariel has never met Ursula, doesn't know she exists at the first note of that song. And three minutes later, she's signing away her voice and, and signed this contract to go up on land. And that all happened in that song, where the opening of Belle was all about Belle going shopping and meeting Gaston and meeting LeFou and seeing everybody. In, that was all in a song. Right. So I think the amount of plot in a song, and, and what these guys always did that amazed me is, you put songs in a movie not for, for, for the only reason that this is the only place that your heart has to sing out. It's what you said. It's, it's I'm so in love that I can't talk anymore, so I have to sing. <laughs> right. I'm so you know, angry at the villain, I can't talk anymore, I have to sing. <laughs> so it's those moments, those peak moments of the story that those songs go in. And I think that's what makes not only the films of our era, but of Walt Disney's era so memorable. And, and the, the genius of Walt and, and you and, and some of these direct, Paul, like you'll look and you'll go, you know what, we need a song right here, right? And just put it there to help tell a story or to move the emotion. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of times they don't work and a lot of songs fall by the wayside. And like, and, and like Can You Feel the Love Tonight, we, tr we tried to cut that out of the movie because Lion King isn't a love story. Uh. And so we did cut it out of the movie for a while. And then we thought, well, let's have Puma and Timon sing it because maybe it'll leaven it and be more fun. <laughs> Um, and then we showed the movie to Elton, and he convinced us to leave the song in the movie. Um, but he had a good reason for it. He felt like these are the songs that Disney movies are yeah. made of, those emotional connections. And, and of course, it went on to win an Oscar and everything else, but he was right. It's that emotional connection you have to the characters through the music. It is a love story. That movie is a love story to me, especially the father-son. Mm. Go ahead. You worked with Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. Uh, how was working with them and how they helped mold the stories? Wow, they were incredibly involved in it. So if you look at uh, Little Mermaid or uh, Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin, they were there all the time. And Howard was going back and forth between Los Angeles and New York, and Alan was in Los Angeles for extended periods. And they were in the story room. You know, they were with these guys, with the story crew, coming up with ideas. And at one point on Beauty, we took all the storyboards back to Howard in New York, and it was so challenging and fun because we'd be ripping things off the storyboard and repinning things, and uh, Alan was there with a portable piano. We're just trying to workshop this stuff and make it work all the time. So amazing people, but right there in the room, they weren't ivory tower writers. They were right there with us in the room, and I think that's why those songs feel so integrated into the story. And what then when you're sitting in the theater and you see that character, and you see the audience react to it, and, and, you, and you, watch, you watch us just forget our lives and whatever we're going through and dig into that story, well, that, how does that feel? <laughs> it's really, really special because you, you invest so much into developing them, you stop developing them, them and they became, become real people to you. I care so much about Anna and Elsa. Like, yeah. and, and so when, when people have this reaction to them where they care just as much about them as you do, it's, it's extremely powerful. Floyd, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Let's talk about the process. Like, you, I know you were saying that like, you'll do something, it gets thrown out. Do something, thrown out. Do something, thrown out. Like, talk to, talk to us about that and then also, like, has there been something great that you just loved that got thrown out? Well, that is the story development process. It's, it's mainly trying out ideas. And I tell young story artists who are just coming into this business that most of what you do will be thrown away. You hear that out there? Anybody? Almost everything you do will be thrown away. But we keep the good stuff. There was a lot of stuff you didn't see in the Jungle Book because Walt Disney decided that it didn't work. So consequently, it was cut from the film. Do you remember anything specific? Well, there's one sequence I remember uh, very much, uh, Rocky the Rhino. Okay. <laughs> Rocky the Rhino was a very wacky, zany character voiced by Frankie Fontaine. Huh? Uh, I don't know if you remember, he played Crazy Guggenheim right, on, right, right, on right. the Jackie Gleason show, for those of you who are old enough to remember Jackie Gleason. But Walt didn't think Rocky the Rhino was very funny, so that sequence was cut. Uh, but you know, but it doesn't break my heart when something's cut from a film. Tony, yeah. back to you. Uh, I have waited hours and hours in lines for your rides, over and over and over again. I've been going to Disneyland my entire life and I'm in my 30s and I am still not tired of them. How do you do that? Well, I have a secret, you know. Um, most people design something for the first and only viewing in a film or whatever, but <clears throat> with the rides, you know they're going to be doing just what you did, or we'd be out of business, you know. So I designed the attractions I work on for the 20th ride, 
which means you have to ask yourself, I've waited in line 19 times for an hour. Why am I in this line again? And I think the best answer to that was a storyteller's uh, postcard to Walt Disney. Does everyone know Ray Bradbury? Yeah, OK. So imagine Ray Bradbury and Charles Lawton in a Peter Pan pirate galleon. This is absolutely true. When he got out, he went over to the postcard rack and sent Walt a postcard that said essentially, Walt, I'll be eternally grateful. Today, I flew out of a child's bedroom window over London in a pirate galleon on its way to the stars. Wow, that's And cool. that's what it's all about. You are flying that journey and making the story to reflect the kind of worlds that these guys created. But this time at Disneyland, it's your chance. And that doesn't get old. I think all of us today, I can tell you right now, there's a line that's 45 minutes to an hour long across the street. <laughs> To do that journey, to get to do that, so you we, put new stuff in, or, or do you put little uh, hidden things, or yeah, well, like, see, like the other things we have to do is because we're taking a 90-minute product essentially and condensing it down to five, ten minutes at the most, or even 90 seconds in a dark ride. Um, you have to use other tools, like in the, the rendering there of Splash Mountain, the ending, the finale. It's the finale of the ride. So what do you do to tell that story? It's the end of the day. It's the autumn part of the year, and we've got more audiometronic animals than you've ever seen in your life singing the good old finale. So that's a way of doing that. The other thing that uh, my predecessors, and we try to continue it too, is the magic of lighting to tell a story. You know, you can look at that Peter Pan flight down there and realize if we illuminated that room, it would be a room. But by turning out all the lights and then only illuminating what the artist brush paints, we control exactly that story. So you're only seeing the elements that you know, take you away to another world. So you're in a room that's not much bigger than the stage we're standing on, not where you are, but right here. And yet, for all intents and purposes, you're flying over you know, Never Never Land. So those are very powerful things. And John Hedge had a, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, something that was very powerful that I thought was great about the environments of Disneyland, and that was eliminate all the contradictions, whether they're colors, their music, or things that don't reflect the main story that you're telling. So when you walk down Main Street, the music reflects not just music from the era of the turn of the century, but films and other stories that we have heard that we love. So I was very passionate about putting Hello, Dolly in that, because that put on your Sunday clothes is now a Disney movie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Fox deal. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Sound of Music, too. Was, anyway. Was that song Married that, that was in Up, was that first on Main Street? The mar which one? The, the Married song? Married? From married? Up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but that's the whole thing. It triggers times in your life that yeah. reflect that place and strengthen it. Music becomes a tremendous aid when people are, you're not in a theater where you're paying attention. You're right. talking to your kids and all that. So you've got to work on a secondary level. And that's what the parks are all about. As we all know, many Disney films draw from classic stories. Don, how closely do you stick to the source material for well-known fairy tales? <laughs> that's an amusing question. Um, <laughs> we don't. I mean, the great tradition of Walt Disney storytelling is to say, oh, what a nice fairy tale, and then just, you know, Go not throw it out, but basically throw it out and start over again. Yeah. Disneyfy it. You, you know, I hear Floyd talking about Jungle Book. That was notoriously storyboarded and thrown out a couple of times before the final version to lighten it and leaven it. Um, if you look at the original fairy tales of something like Beauty and the Beast or uh, Sleeping Beauty, a lot of times they're dark, a lot of times Little Mermaid. You know, they're, they're very difficult to adapt exactly the way they are, Pinocchio. They're twisted, uh, disturbing fairy tales, which what, it's what attracts us to them. Um, but in there, there's something really wonderful and human about those stories that we are attracted to, uh, but you have to be happy to throw things out and slay your darlings along the way and say, you know, this may have worked 200 years ago in a French court. It doesn't work today. <laughs> Were those, those fairy tales public domain? Like, you guys just yeah. use them or you don't have to? That's helpful. That's so yes, any of you could do uh, Beauty and the Beast. It's a public domain thing. All right. Uh, Paul, talk to us about research of, of the yeah. real life places and people. And you told me a great story about when you were doing research for Raya. Research is super, super important. 
I mean, we're, we're constantly striving for authenticity in our films, and because we're creating a fantasy world. The, the world that Riot in The Last Dragon takes place in is in this place called Kumandra, but is in, it is inspired by Southeast Asia, so we were really fortunate. Whole team of us, we traveled through Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, down to Bali and Indonesia, and it's, it's a really interesting thing because there's, there's research that you're looking at these incredible environments and landscapes. I mean, Angkor Wat, everybody should go visit Angkor Wat. That is an incredible place. But for me, it's much more emotional research. I, um, in, in Laos, for example, we're invited to take, take part in this, it's called Basi Sukhwan Fest Ceremony. And uh, it's basically all of the elders and uh, some family members from this uh, area come together and it's a blessing ceremony, and they, they actually always keep this one on. I've had it on for like a year now. It's getting a little dirty, but it's this white band. I had all of my arms were covered with these white kind of string, pieces of string, because each of these elders comes up to you, and as they're tying this little string around your, your arm, they're telling you this good fortune, this blessing of safe travels and where you're going, and to know that they are with you and that they, they have love for you. And it's this beautiful thing to, to experience that and to sit back and go, this is something that I want to take back with me to my family mm. and know that my family members even are loved and supported and give them a blessing. So it's, it's really impactful when you experience those things. And just from an observer, I'm sitting there looking and they're going, this is our world and how we're approaching something very similar, mm. which all of a sudden makes the world seem a little bit closer together, which is a beautiful thing when we can see like someone on the other side of the world is dealing with something very similar, but, but not the same as... It's a small world, after all. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's where that's going. The cathedral, <laughs> uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral? Yeah, with, with uh, Hans Becker of Notre Dame, we, you know, Victor Hugo, when he wrote that novel, said he climbed up in the towers of Notre Dame and he saw carved into the rocks the word fate. And that was his inspiration for writing this amazing piece of literature. And so we did. We got access to the towers and the bells of Notre Dame and climbed way in the heck up in the air. And, and there's something about it. It's the emotional travel that you're talking about where you're absolutely transported, not just to another time, but to another um, ethic and aesthetic and cultural time. It's like time travel to stand there and look at these bells that were forged three and 400 years ago and the beams that have been up there from oak trees that grew 400 years ago. And it's emotional. And then you have a setting that you can put those characters in. Um, and, and that setting becomes the storytelling as much as the characters themselves. So yeah, the, the, that travel was really moving and, uh, and the wine was really good too. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something that I didn't know until today, that, that Walt Disney Studios, they created the storyboard first. That was the, they did it first and now we use it in films and television and creating rides. Floyd, tell us about, what is a storyboard for us novices? Well, the storyboard is simply a visual narrative. Uh, it, is, it is a way of visualizing uh, the script. Mm -hmm. And it's because motion pictures uh, happen to be a visual medium, it's hard to think of making a movie without thinking in terms of visuals. Now, for me as an artist, uh, as a cartoonist, I, I tend to see everything in pictures. So to me, the images always come first. And then I add the words later. Now. Back in the early days, Walt Disney was the only studio creating storyboards. But now storyboards have become, you know, everybody uses them. Big films are not done today without storyboards being created first. Guys like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, Alfred Hitchcock used storyboards extensively to nail down his visuals. But it all started with Walt. It was all Walt Disney storytelling that, uh, gave us the storyboard. Is that you, this, these are your drawings, these are yours, right, from? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so, and, and some shots of Walt as he. Uh, That's, he used to draw, you know, goof on all the, the colleagues <laughs> and, and put him up on the, do you guys do that, Paul, did you, is that what animators do? Uh, yeah, it's actually every April 1st we have a caricature show, oh. which is brutal, and it really makes you reevaluate re everything <laughs> in your life, so it's, uh, it's still going. And nobody's safe, Jen Lee, Everybody is on the fair game. Do you do people know whose style it is? Oh, I mean, Walt knew yeah. it was you, right? He yeah. said, "Hey, you smartass, come up here and be funny." 
right? You mean on the storyboards? Yeah. You know, we well, we all drew alike. Uh, so so many of us on on Jungle Book, uh, Dick Lucas and Eric Cleaworth, Vance Gary, mm -hmm. and myself. I, I had I honestly had a difficult time trying to tell my drawings from all the other guys because we were all drawing basically with a grease pencil. Yeah. That was our because Walt loved the grease pencil, the China marker, because he liked big bold drawings. He liked ideas to be put down boldly and dramatically. He didn't like a lot of frou frou. So he wanted ideas to be clearly stated. So we all used these big, fat China markers when we did our storyboards. Would he go up with a marker himself and fix things, change things? No, usually Walt would just go to the board and rip things off, <laughs> let, him, <laughs> let him fall to the floor. <laughs> now, theme parks have also used storyboards and models and computer simulations to create the immersive worlds that we love, too. Uh, how do you like to visualize your attractions? Well, I'm a visual thinker, so uh, the script always comes after the place starts to take shape. You know, so you've got, you know, maybe a piece of ground, maybe a uh, challenge that the park has to fill an area with more people. Uh, those become kind of the leading things, and then you kind of back into it by creating a. In, in case here you're looking at Splash Mountain, it was a very tight piece of ground. And when it was under construction, it looked like the, a five-story uh, apartment building was going in next to the Haunted Mansion, you know, because it was steel and everyone's going, what have you done? But, um, you know, we knew this story was going to fit. <clears throat> we start with New Orleans. We have the plantations of the Haunted Mansion and then out into the bayous. So we had a nice segue there. And once we planted it all out, like the model looked, and the models give us so much confidence that it's going to work. So when everyone is at the park freaking out about this big giant building, we're seeing this model. We know where it's going. And so that becomes, in the same way as the storyboard, is so critical. And we do them too. Uh, but the models become something where you can't cheat. There's no way to cheat. It's the same piece of ground, only miniaturized. So many times, those models are built big enough that they can be used in the field so that one inch in the model equals a foot of ground in the, in the space. So that's, it's a incredible tool to us. But there was a bunch of extra figures laying around from America Sings. No, they, well... Hey, we have these <laughs> figures, what are we gonna, let's... These, these elements, I think for me, when Marty used to call it the blank sheet of paper. Yeah. And by that, it's like, we don't even have an idea, we just know we need to do something, how are we gonna do it? The best way to quick, get that quick, is to think of something that you were completely you know, inspired by or just became such a part of your life, something that touched you, like the Wizard of Oz, or for mm. me, uh, the Moses parting the Red Sea. And if you look closely here, you can see Triton, King Triton, uh, parting the seas to our original Seas Pavilion idea. And we didn't build it, as Floyd says, we uh, don't always build everything. I think it would have been great, though. Uh, but. We had Triton throwing his uh, Triton out at the uh, water and parting it, and then allowing all the guests in the audience to walk through the ocean oh, that's into uh, the story of the sea, which I thought would have been a very theatrical and very Disney thing and very aspirational. Mm -hmm. And it would have given me my Moses moment. Yeah, it was just, yeah. <laughs> they did it over at Universal, so if you want to go over there, they part the sea and you can walk right through. Well, you know. <laughs> Hey, we both like this guy, don't we? Oh, figure, yeah. my favorite. <clears throat> yeah. This, we were, we were on a track and we had gotten Dreamfinder and I watched Magnum P.I., the story I've told about Magnum hit a goat and he told Higgins it was just a figment of his imagination and, and Higgins said, figments don't eat grass. And I said, there's our name. Anyway. Yeah. What turned it into something that everyone could digest and really fell in love with was, was we brought the Sherman Brothers, again through music, came on board, and we said, can you create a song like they did for Small World and they did for the Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, you know, uh, Carousel of Progress and uh, Tiki Room? How do you explain this complex thing of gathering, you're gathering information, storing it, and then creating something new from the things you learned today? And they said, we got it. And so out of that came one little spark. And then that just became the unlocking moment to kind of creating that, that whole attraction. That's great. Hey, Paul, you are, uh, have been a, sort of a, a part of the movement of bringing more women into the Walt Disney Studios, right? I think, yeah. It's, um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting, because Floyd and I were talking earlier about uh, just the story process. And really, it hasn't changed that much over 
many, many years. I actually, it's funny you bring up um, the Rhino thing because I actually have that photo stat behind my desk and I keep it as reference of, it's a Bill Peep sequence. Incredible economy of boards. So storyboarding hasn't really changed that much. What I see really changing right now is this dynamic and it's awesome of a lot of women coming into animation. You know, there's Natalie Norgott who just showed her short here and, and of course Jin Lee, our, our chief creative officer. And even Josie Trinidad, like there's some really incredible women in the studio right now, and uh, I, uh, it's it's a it's a great time. Good for you. And you were the head of story for Frozen, right? And I was. Pretty yes. cool. Yes, it was a uh, an amazing, amazing experience because again, like working with Jin Lee and Chris Buck, I have so much respect for them, and uh, and and the songwriters too. So, in that movie, that you know, we were just talking about how films get. You know, you'll be working on something for a while. Frozen at first was this <coughs> love triangle between Kristoff, Anna, and Elsa. And Elsa and Anna weren't really so much sisters. And so at that time when I saw the movie, I wasn't on it, but I looked over there and I was like, nope, I don't want to do that love triangle. <laughs> That's not. And then all of a sudden that whole thing was thrown out. And it's like now this becomes a story about sisters. So it's, uh, right. it's, it's really exciting. And plus I think too, I mean, what's fun now is... Yeah, like I was saying before, storyboarding really hasn't changed much. It's all, we're drawing completely digital, which is really fun. And we pitch now, rather than on these boards that you saw even Walt pitching, we actually come into the story room and we pitch these stories just digitally on the screen. So we're going through them. These are some of my boards from, from Princess and the Frog. So I kind of just go through these things and, <laughs> thank you, and, and pitch them digitally. But it's the same exact process. That, you still draw it, right? It's still just... draw it, still draw it, which is really hard because... You're a writer, and you have to visually communicate. It's all about visual communication and visual and these ideas. And so in some of the hardest storyboards that I have to draw, I, I know when they are coming because it's, you know, even in this, in this song sequence, Mama Odie's song, there's a line in, in the script. We work a lot closely with writers, but there's a line in the script where it says, Naveen looks over and falls in love with, and you can see in his eyes he's falling in love with Tiana. And I was like, how do I draw that? <laughs> and it's incredible because I spend a whole day drawing just two eyes where I'm like, no, that, no, he's not in love. He's not. And it all came down, it was really funny because it all came down to just a slight, like I drew a pair of eyes and then all of a sudden it was just a little bit of the eyes just opening just a little. And it's really what's, it's more about what's happening behind those eyes of going, this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with which I know that feeling and I'm just trying to capture it, which is such a hard feeling to capture in a drawing. That's when you're like, I shouldn't have <laughs> chosen this profession. I should have been, I should, could have been anything else. Why did I choose to draw? It's so hard. And a lot of uh, storytelling does have to do with the background and the world that these stories belong in, which we've talked about with Tony and the rides, but I want to talk about it in films as well. We have uh, Disney films like Sleeping Beauty, uh, Wonderland, The Temples of Jungle Book. I mean. The, it's the incredible live action world with 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Mary Poppins, Tron, Dawn. How do you create these entirely new worlds for film? Uh, wow. Um, it, it's about creating a, a sense of transportation for the audience. I always feel like creating a world is like um, the transportation business where you can take the audience to a place and a time that they can never go themselves. And when we go to the theaters, we want to be that, get that feeling of suspended reality. We want to go uh, feel and kind of walk in the shoes of other characters. And, and the environment in that world is very much a part of that. And it is, by the way, if you're making attractions or if you're painting oil paintings 100 years ago or painting on cave walls, the work of an artist, uh, be he or she a writer or artist, is to show you what it's like to be me, show you what it's like to walk in my shoes for a day. If you can do that, that's the macro aspect of the world you're building. Then you can get down to, okay, how can that world help tell my story? How can you walk into a room and there's no character in there? Like if you were to walk into my bedroom as a kid and I weren't there, you would know everything about me, which I won't reveal right well, now. Yeah, what, <laughs> but, um, but you do, you learn about that. Yeah. If I were to you know, go into any of your rooms and, and, and rummage around, which I'll do later today, you'll, <laughs> you'll understand who that person is. And that's, that's that transportation, to, that's that world building that we all try to strive for. It's like, that's interesting. And, and Paul, you've done uh, Zootopia, which is yeah. a whole incredible world. I mean, tell us about that. I mean, I'm 
Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6. Yeah. Well, it does. It all starts with that. You want to be, when you go to a movie theater, you want to be transported to this magical place. It's this escape from the world you're in, in a way, and you go, okay, everything that's going on in the outside world, I don't care about anymore because I am here. And I really appreciate when, um, again, it comes back to research and authenticity, and, and you can see that the filmmaker has done their homework, and you start to build these worlds, but they make sense. I mean, even, you know, even with Zootopia, there was a ton of research just <laughs> done in animal relationships and the dynamics between certain animals and herbivores and carnivores. And so there was this, all this research done that then starts to influence design and you know, construction of sets, because we have to build everything from scratch. Nothing is given to us for free. So you got to make a door for an elephant, but you also have to make a door for a mouse and everything in between. So uh, there's just a lot of just research again that goes. Do you ever just lay in bed, like right before falling asleep, and just have ideas? And does that ever happen to any of you guys? It's a dangerous yeah. thing. It's a dangerous I, thing. I call it the I call it the story Rubik's cube because all of a sudden my brain starts solving story problems. And I'm like, okay, I actually have an old like vintage Game Boy that I'll play Tetris just for a second, just to make my brain stop. Mm. Wow. It's, it's now, there's did, so much to do. Yeah. I did mine on traffic, traffic jams. Oh, really? My thing. Oh. An hour every day, you know. Something hits you in the middle of the night, you go, oh, I got Yeah, I mean, because you're completely right. focused on just the rear bumper of the car in yeah. front of you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about color? <clears throat> Floyd, tell us about color. Well, uh, Don had spoken earlier about Mary Blair, and, and Mary had a tremendous influence on the Disney feature films. She had such a brilliant color sense. And I remember going to Pixar Animation Studios in the 90s to work on Toy Story 2. And one of the things I noticed was a lot of Mary Blair uh, color concepts on the walls of Pixar. And I'm thinking Mary probably did these uh, sketches in the 40s or 50s. And here we were, you know, uh, years and years later and a, a whole new generation of artists still referring to the, uh, the beautiful uh, color sense of Mary Blair. Mm -hmm. So she's had a profound influence on animation, both at the Walt Disney Studios and Pixar. And Tony, you, you talk about color, lights, black lights in your ride. Yeah. I noticed, you know, when you go into those, some of your rides with the black lights, you can see who has caps and who, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, again, <laughs> <laughs> there is that. They look, black lights are great in the kitchen, too, if you want to spoil your wife's uh, cleanliness there. Uh, <laughs> but no, all of these tools, whether it's black light or it's the technique we created on Indiana Jones to give you the sense of motion as you're going through a ride uh, and feeling the experience for the first time, telling a story through you know, experiential feelings. Um, all of these are no different than the original paint that was put on a cell. They're just another tool that we have to tell a story in a more meaningful way that uh, immerses you more deeply in it. And so I think that's always been a tradition of Disneyland. And when um, the, those original blacklight rides were created, I think they were the most immersive things that had ever been done. Maybe, maybe the Jungle Cruise I would put in that too. After seeing the, the film that's been generated out of that yesterday, it looked fantastic. So I think a lot of people have those rides as a communal, communal experience that's lasted for a coming up on almost 65, 70 years uh -huh. now. Yeah. To infinity and beyond, what's the future of storytelling? Uh, technology, will that, you know, will that come into play more and further change the way you guys? Well, do? you know, technologies, you've all been over there to ride, um, you know, a smuggler's run and uh, wait till you see the other one. And I think I can talk a little bit about it because you saw it today. Can't wait um, for time. It involves so many different technologies that have got to work together, and that's why it's taking our team a long time to deliver this, is to make sure all of those things work. But uh, when you move through a seamless experience, crossing from one you know, type of transport to another, it's extraordinary. Nothing like that's ever been done before. But at the end of it, it's just about telling a story. If you just put it there to blow people away of the technology, it wouldn't work. It's like when Star Tours was fresh, when we did it in 1987, we all thought, you know, we'd have a good year if we just made a fun bump in the dark kind of simulator ride, but we put it in concert with Star Wars, something every kid grew up with. And here it is now, we're um, plus 40, I think, almost on it. 
uh, close anyway, I mean, 80, I can't, 90, mm -hmm. 30 something. And um, it's still got a line out there because it's not that it's a simulator and that that was breakthrough in 87, it's that it takes you, allows you to go into that world. Mm -hmm. And the world building thing is gonna be awakened like never before with all these technologies. You know, that's Lloyd, it, you've been telling stories a long time. What, what, what do you think the future holds? Well, I've been able to, uh, you know, kind of like see the transition. I mean, I yeah. started out old school Disney. When I came to the studio, Walt and his uh, artists were still making films, uh, you know, pencil and paper. Everything was uh, hand drawn, hand created. And then transitioned to Pixar, where I, I went Hi. up to Pixar and saw animation totally change, totally transform <laughs> by, by the new digital medium. So, but I think the one thing will remain the same. Uh, storytelling is basic. Whether it's done by hand, whether it's done by computers, uh, good solid storytelling is Disney. Yeah. And uh, that will always be with us. No matter what, that's beautiful. W very quickly, we only have a few more minutes, but I, wanna, I want you all to go down the line and tell us the most, what story influenced you or moved you the most in your life? Hmm. Paul? Start with me. Um, I mean, just, I think a really impactful story, I would say, is I, that changed my life, honestly, was when I was little, I was in this bookstore, this Walden's bookstore in Florida, Boca Raton, Florida, and I found this book called The Illusion of Life. And the, this is a book written by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, two of the nine old men. And I started flipping through this book, and it was, it was my creative Bible. I thought, this is, this is something that people do, people draw. And it was a really big book. That book is like this thick. Huh. And um, I remember my mom came up to me in the bookstore. And she's like, Where have you, I've been looking for you forever. Where have you been? I was like, Mom, this book. And we were, at the time, pretty poor. And I remember her holding this book and flipping it over, and I could tell her eyes were looking down at this price tag on this book. It's an expensive book. But then I just remember her looking at, and it must have been my eyes, but she was like, okay, we'll get this book. Oh, thank God. I thought she was going to steal it. I didn't this could have been a tragedy. <laughs> could have been a tragedy. Again, I could have... But I swear, I, even as we were walking through that mall, I was still just flipping through these pages. And I was like, I thought, I, I have to go there. That's this magical place that are people like me. Like, I was constantly drawing. And, and even in these drawings, I could tell right away there was emotion and life in these drawings. And I was like, I want to do that. Nice. And my mom, to all her credit, really kind of put me on that path of going, Nice. There you go. Go there. And here I I mean, I'm Incredible. honestly, it's I'm super fortunate and it's an honor to be sitting now oh. on the stage with Don you. Don Hahn? Um, yeah, it is. I, I feel the same way. I feel, uh, I, I always go like, you know, why am I here? Because uh, it's such a collaborative medium and I think all of us understand that, is that we work with hundreds and hundreds of brilliant people and that's, you know, we might be spokespeople for them, but we're collaborators. Um, and when I was growing up, the movies that were mostly uh, influential to me were, uh, you'll laugh at some of these, uh, one was um, Charlie Brown Christmas, yeah. because it's a perfect movie. Um, one was, yeah, I mean, when you analyze it, it is full of heart. Yep. It's not the most uh, amazing animation you've ever seen. The studio tried to cancel it. It was never to make it on the air, but it has that great jazz score and everything else. It's so moving to me. And the other one that I think traumatized us all was Wizard of Oz. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. Totally <laughs> caught me at a young age and, and still haunts me every night. <laughs> Tony? Well, Sleeping Beauty uh, was when I was 12 years old, and uh, I think I sat in the theater three showings to see the dragon fight at the yeah. end of that. Uh, so that impressed me. And then I think the stop motion work of um, Ray Harryhausen was another thing that. Which one? Ray Harryhausen, who created the seventh voyage of Sinbad and the Jason and the Argonauts. Those were real, but not real. It was something that, it was before CGI, and so it was a, a, a primitive way of seeing animation in dimension. And that got me, I think, thinking about getting into the dimensional side of this. Um, and finding a way to bring creatures and 
places to life in, in a dimensional world with that incredible styling of Ivan Earl and Sleeping Beauty. If I could marry those two, it'd be amazing. Floyd? Walt Disney's probably shortest feature animated film. Uh, I have to thank my colleagues, the wonderful Dick Humor and Joe Grant, for giving us a little film called Dumbo, oh. the film that really influenced me as a kid. Beautiful. Well, gentlemen, uh, discord is at an all-time high and decency at an all-time low, but thank God we have gentlemen like you and, and the women uh, to tell these stories and lift us up and make this world a better place. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon.